and welcome to podcast Bridging Voices, the online discussion forum of the multinational development policy dialogue of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Brussels. My name is Louis Morier, Program Manager for Climate Policy at the Foundation, and today we're discussing a new policy paper on updating African NDCs in times of COVID-19, a paper that we have just published. We have three fantastic speakers for our debate today. With us is uh, Anne Knappen, Policy Officer on Climate Change at the European Center for Development Policy Management and an expert on EU-Africa relations. Warm welcome to you, Anne. Thank you. Happy to be here. And we also have um, Olivia Rumble and Andrew Gilder, both directors of Climate Legal, a climate consultancy in South Africa, and actually the authors of the paper. So warm welcome to you, Andrew and Olivia, and great that you join us from South Africa. Hi, Louis. Thank you. Nice. Look forward to it. A few months ago, COVID-19 hit climate action in the global south at the very worst time possible. Because just before the crisis, more than 100 developing countries had expressed their intention to increase the ambition of their NDCs. African countries seem particularly eager to intensify their climate efforts. Almost all sub-Saharan African countries had committed to enhanced NDCs by the end of 2020. So at least in sub-Saharan Africa, parties to the Paris Agreement seemed well on track to pass the first test of the ratchet up mechanism, the most important piece of increased ambition in the Paris Agreement. But then COVID came and the situation in Africa changed drastically. The ongoing health and economic crisis pushed climate change to lower levels of priority. The rise of public debt in African countries reduced the funds available for more ambitious policies on climate change mitigation and COVID restrictions made stakeholder engagement for NDC updates almost impossible. So in these difficult times, we at CAS wondered, have we lost momentum in matters of African climate action? What is and what should the EU be doing to restore ambition in NDC updates across the continent? And what are the consequences for the Paris Agreement if vast parts of the global south, including uh, sub-Saharan Africa, is unwilling or are simply unable to update their NDCs by the end of the year as actually foreseen in the agreement? Olivia and Andrew, these are some of the questions that you answered in um, our new policy paper. Can you tell us, is there still appetite among African LDCs to review and update national climate action plans? And what can you realistically expect from the African region until the end of the year? Uh, thanks, Louis. Uh, it's a good way to start. Um, the African continent has quite a lot of ambition if you compare it to other Uh, both developed and developing countries. And um, in the paper that we just put together, there's a lovely uh, graphic that demonstrates countries that have indicated some kind of willingness to update their NDCs um, and increase ambition. And you'll see there's a quite a large blue cl cluster right in the middle. Um, effectively, the whole of the African continent is shaded out um, as uh, indicating an intention or and a desire to update NDCs. And, and that's very much part of um, quite a, a useful engagement program by the NDC partnership um, on the continent and um, getting African countries to make public statements um, on, on their level of ambition through Twitter or other social media platforms. Um, and there has been quite a lot of support um, in getting African countries to um, revisit and revise their NDCs, at least historically. Um, so absolutely, there has been relatively a lot more, I would say, ambition uh, on the African continent to update NDCs as compared to both developed and other developing country regions. But I suppose the, the topic we're here to discuss today is uh, the impacts of COVID on that. And uh, the, there are unfortunately some issues and stresses Uh, that the African group of negotiators, the AGN, have picked up on. Um, and uh, it, 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 it is very much remains to be seen whether um, those expressed intentions will then materialize into something more concrete uh, in terms of uh, more ambitious and updated NDCs, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, before the COP uh, at the beginning of next year. So Louis, if, if I could pick up from what Olivia has just said. Yes, so I, I don't think there's any, any question that um, African countries are active, willing um, participants in the international climate change regime, particularly now as, as under Paris. They completely get and understand the need to um, update NDCs. I mean, it's, it's 
you know, the, this would be the, the end of the first five-year cycle um, under, under Paris. And in fact, if we, we were, uh, you know, we should be on the cusp of going into COP26. We're not because of COVID and COP26 is delayed by a year. The question, so then, is not so much the ambition, but is, in, in, a, in a very practical level, if you are in a developing or a least developed uh, country on the African continent, how do you practically go about going through the processes that are required uh, indeed to inform an update of your NDC, NDC and to achieve that update? And the purpose of this paper, um, I guess, is to look at some of the, the less usual or the more unusual factors that have become exacerbated um, as a result of COVID and perhaps are leading or might lead to the perception um, that some of these countries are doing less than is expected of them. On the contrary, they want to do more. Sometimes the hurdles are in their way that um, might give the perception that they are not taking these actions. Yes, thank you very much to you, Olivia and Andrew, for these opening comments. Um, I think uh, these are very important and they show in what kind of difficult situation we are in at the moment. Um, and in that context, Anne, let me get, let, let me get you in the, into the discussion. Um, I think Olivia and Andrew shortly touched on the very difficult situation many African LDCs face, LDCs face at the moment. Um, and also in their paper, they state that the World Bank predicts that the global economy will shrink by more than 5% in 2020. And the World Food Programme has warned that millions of people will suffer from starvation, including in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so with that in mind, and also taking into account the principle of common but differentiated responsibility, is it actually fair in terms of climate justice to expect African LDCs to move forward with ambitious climate action in the near future? Um, thank you for the question, Louis. Um, I think this is very important to discuss, but let me first say that um, I was happy to hear that um, uh, Olivia said that um, the, the current NDCs of African countries um, are, are uh, very ambitious. So, and I've also read about very good examples of African um, LDCs, even putting forward a strong climate action. There is, for example, Cote d'Ivoire that is focusing on its transition from coal to renewable energy. In Mali, we see that they are mainstreaming climate fin finance into the national budget. So that's all. There is already happening a lot within African LDCs. But I think, um, based on the principle, that's also an important central principle to the Paris Agreement. Um, so the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, this should always be kept in mind. Although we must say that the idea of differentiation is a continuum. You cannot categorize countries in just simply two groups. Um, and and uh, this it's also an old principle dating back to the beginning of the 90s. The world has changed a lot. Some countries that were very poor are now more developed in Africa. Um, but so uh, I think most of the of, of African countries, especially the LDCs, they should be supported, um, not only financially, but also in, with capacity building, technical assistance and so on. The EU has a very special role to play there. I think we will discuss that later. Um, but um, I think uh, based on work that I did before, um, there are four key ingredients I think for African LDCs to achieve successful climate ambition, that's also very important for the NDCs L and, and to make sure that they are being implemented in the right way. And I think the first one is awareness. So um, awareness of the climate issue, not only within the government, but also at the individual level at all scales of a society. And I think education is key for that. Also what we see is that there is a lot of youth activism in Africa. This is well, less well known in, the, in Europe where it's very strong, but it's very important to give these young activists also a platform in Africa. And then a second ingredient is stakeholder involvement. We see that there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of climate activities within the climate communities in countries, also within the Ministry of Environment, for instance, in a country. But it's important to break these silos and to make sure also in the processing, in the process of updating uh, the NDCs that um, 
this that all the all the line ministries, even the private sector and so on, is involved in this process, and that there is very good communication between, for example, environment and finance ministers. And then I think um, a third is financial support, which I already mentioned. And here, um, if we if we look at the situation that has been created by the the COVID crisis, the whole pandemic, the lockdown. Um, this, this could actually, um, based on the rhetoric around Build Back Better, offer new opportunities. If we make sure that all the economic recovery packages are designed based on this principle of Build Back Better um, and make sure that environmental, um, um, environmental factors are being integrated into recovery packages, into new investments, then this could actually offer an opportunity. And this awareness did not exist back in 2008 um, when, when we had another global financial crisis. So countries were not uh, ready with operational plans uh, to be implemented under time pressure back then. And then I think a fourth uh, very important factor is having the right policies and regulatory framework. And I think um, this may be a failure um, of the UNFCCC process. Actually, that there has not been there has not been enough guidance for countries, not only African LDCs, but all in um, helping to set up um, the right um, framework for for LDCs. We see that um, adaptation, for instance, is very important for for African, especially um, poorer. Um, countries, there um, they have not been able to do the right vulnerability assessments to design um, or, or to give ideas for design of projects. So it's also then difficult for um, potential partners or donors to to assist these countries. So having this the right um, frameworks in in place is a fourth um, important ingredient, I think. Thank you so much for these very extensive statements. Uh, uh, I think that you touched on three important points. And uh, I think the way you structured it into, into these four uh, key ingredients to achieve uh, a successful trans trans transition towards green economies in Africa is um, actually pretty interesting. And I just want to come to <laughs> Andrew and Olivia. Um, do you have some thoughts on that? Uh, um, yeah. and they, are these could, could, I, could I make a point, uh, um, uh, just flowing from, from what the, con the conversation has gone at? And it's an, it's an interesting one. Um, to, to get your head around. Um, um, Hannes mentioned the, the perceived lack of guidance from the UNFCCC to LDCs in terms of uh, you know, how they should, should structure adaptation programs. I mean, it's very interesting critique that because it's actually exactly the same critique that, that is leveled against the UNFCCC process um, around how countries frame climate, you know, uh, uh, the, the, their needs assessment. If you're a donor country, if you're a, if you're an EU country, and part of what your role in in the whole process is is to provide um, donor funding to support certain initiatives in um, developing and least developed countries, then one of the things you need to know is what are the needs in those countries. And often the critique is, well, you as a country that has needs are, are unable to articulate what your needs are. So how can I fund you? it's not very useful to seek to apply a developed country standard or a developed country requirement around um, how one determines needs assessments or how one um, goes through um, scientific and other processes if you are applying that standard in a least developed country. So in a sense, the, the discussion of what is needed needs to be turned around and asked from the perspective of the country that has the need. Let me give you a, a, a very personal illustration from a South African context. Regularly in South Africa, we, we like to compare ourselves to some of the most developed economies in the world like the US, but that's not the US or EU economies. But those are not the economies that South Africa should be comparing itself to. Economies that we are, um, that we fit into are Turkey and Mexico um, and, and Colombia, those kind of economies, which means that the, the dynamics applicable in those economies needs to be taken into account when you say, oh, it's time to update your NDC. 
This is what you need to do to update your NDC and here are the practical activities we, we, we want to see you um, undertake. So simple, practical illustration of what I'm saying. If you're in a, in a least developed country and you need now to update your NDC and you need to call meetings, if you're in a scenario where people cannot physically meet because of COVID, then in the absence of good internet in your country, you can't update your NDC because you can't have meetings. Those kind of dynamics do not apply in more developed economies. This is extremely helpful. Yes, thank you very much, Andrew, for your comments. And, and I want to continue with one little topic that you touched on, uh, not a little topic, a very important topic, actually, uh, and that's the issue of climate finance. Uh, um, I think it's particularly important in the case of Africa Because um, Olivia and Andrew, as you noted um, in your policy paper, all sub-Saharan African NDCs have incorporated two mitigation targets. First, an unconditional target that will be financed with national resources. And second, a conditional target, which can only be met if the global community provides enough funds. Um, but in the past, sub-Saharan African uh, countries have only benefited from a fraction of climate finance. And with Western donors at the moment, um, under considerable strain, uh, financial constraints, uh, things don't really seem to be to to be get to be getting um, any better soon. Uh, so perhaps, um, Olivia, that's a question for you. How do African LDC uh, LDCs deal with their dependency on Western climate finance in the midst of this pandemic? And is there a concern that donors may fail to provide uh, the financial pledges they committed before the crisis? It's it's a fascinating question actually, and I think it it might be a bit early to say um, what will happen with the funding cycles at the moment. I know at the at present there is a concern um, expressed again by the AGN that uh, climate finance is uh, being tapering out as a result of the pandemic and a sort of in, more inward focus of financial priorities amongst donor countries. Um, it's also quite interesting timing because I'm sure as you know, um, this upcoming COP, uh, the one that was postponed, was supposed to be the time at which countries were going to renegotiate or at least commence discussions on their global climate finance commitments after 2025. And um, so it's unfortunate that the COP was postponed for that reason. But um, I guess that issue will come to a head uh, in Glasgow next year uh, when parties revisit that discussion but I suppose going back to your question there's there's obviously no magic answer to how to really make a country's NDC process more attractive to finance but there have been some suggestions to do things like um, an investment plan for NDC implementation so to um, almost package your NDC in such a way that it's easy to finance and um, with sort of Uh, clear objectionable goals that and so that funders only need to go okay to, in order to implement this project this investment plan projects this amount of finance and these are the steps that are going to be implemented in order to action it uh, or at least prioritizing needs within an NDC so obviously you can't find everything in an NDC but um, if countries could at least list their top two or three priorities it might be renewable energy it might be um building a sea level rise that might be further research into adaptation um, that in turn will at least ensure that priority actions are financed and then you know as I suppose this is a double-edged sword but it, at least some are saying that perhaps we should have a more focused discussion or greater attention towards private sector investment so and, and we all know that public sector investment will never be able to meet the scale of the adaptation costs um, required by the continent or at least the globe um, and so um, how do we bring in the private sector in a more um, attractive way um, and that may be uh, steps incumbent more on um, on domestic countries um, within Africa to try and create a more private sector friendly environment whether you include private sector investment in the definition of climate finance though is I guess a bit debatable and, and uh, I, I'm sure there are many who would disagree with me that this is a step that countries should be focusing on given current stresses but I suppose one to canvas. I suppose lastly and this one seems obvious 
doing things at a domestic level to promote investor confidence and um, things like robust accounting systems um, having processes for MRV, having uh, procedures in place to monitor uh, adaptation, climate finance, technological support, that type of thing. Whilst I doubt uh, many countries, particularly LDCs, have all of those processes in place, um, it can certainly help. And I know, for example, Rwanda, for instance, has done a lot in this regard to try and rebrand itself as a really good and attractive place to spend climate finance, to put it bluntly. Um, and I actually sh shortly want to come back to you because you're very close um, here in Brussels to donors. And I wanted to ask you, um, drawing from what um, Olivia just said, uh, what can African LDCs do to break through um, their donor dependency uh, when it comes to NDC updates? Um, do you have some thoughts here? Well, I think um, when it comes to climate finance, a lot uh, can be said. Let me first start by... Um, telling you a bit about what's happening within the EU institutions, because I think we are at the critical point now. As the European Council reached a proposal on the EU budget for the next period, from 2021 until 2027, that was in July. Um, so the overall budget will be 1.8 billion. So this combines the multi-annual financial framework that will be about 1,000 billion, and then um, an, a special recovery effort um, for the to, for the COVID uh, pandemic, known as the Next Generation EU budget of 750 billion. Uh, and there is also an overall climate target of 30% for this multi-annual financial framework and also the next generation EU budget. So, and when we compare this with the current multi-annual financial framework, the difference is not so big. Um, also the funding that would go to external um, action. Um, so that's, there's not a, a huge uh, shift there. That was actually the reason why some experts have described um, the EU's new budget deal as kind of a victim um, of the of the very difficult negotiations. Is that right? Um, I'm not really convinced, actually, that the development cooperation has been a victim of the new EU budget deal in July. So I don't think really the issue is, is resources and the actual amount um, of funding that will be available. Um, although we can also discuss that a bit more in detail, but it will be rather an issue of scale and geographical uh, focus. Um, although I must say that the, the EU will commit uh, considerable amounts going to sub-Saharan Africa um, and through a new instrument, the Neighborhood and Development um, and International Cooperation Instrument. Um, I won't go into the technical details of this. Um, so, but still um, looking at this, you could say that this is not going to help um, Africa with uh, climate action as such. Huh? So they can do pilot projects, demonstration uh, effects, help with uh, capacity building here and there. But um, I think um, there, is, there is much more needed. Um, the point that Olivia raised on the role of the private sector is very important. Um, there is a lot of potential when it comes to renewable energy projects. So um, the mitigation track of climate action, but it's more problematic when you look at adaptation. Also, when you look at the NDCs or the INDCs now, um, there is, when you look at the African ones specifically, a strong focus on agriculture. Um, there is also strong focus on adaptation, um, but how to fund that and what role can the private sector play there? This is something that um, also the, the European Investment Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, EBRD, both of them have been criticized a lot. Um, there is a recent report now uh, that was published by ACT Alliance on climate finance by the EU institutions, and they reiterate that um, the banks have um, provided very little funding to adaptation, whereas their funding and their investments in mitigation projects is very strong. Um, so, uh, but they they plan now in the next uh, cycle to to become a climate bank with a specific focus on adaptation. Um, but what I see also in the African continent is quite interesting initiatives now in involving, for example, the central banks, the AF, the African Development Bank is doing uh, quite good work on this in, um, they have an adaptation benefits mechanism set up, they have worked with the central bank in Nigeria to also make sure that certain amount of investments go to resilience building and adaptation. 
And then um, a third point I would like to make is that it's also important to the extent possible to invest own resources, even in LDCs, um, no matter how small, into um, climate, uh, climate projects. Um, and there um, I had recently an interesting conversation with Professor Salim Ulhuk, who is the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. And actually we talked about what can African countries learn from the example of Bangladesh. And um, so they provide 7.5%, which is quite big, of the national budget purely to climate action. Um, there is also a very high level of awareness. The prime minister is very much involved into climate action. Um, so it's also worth for, I think, for African least developed countries to look at what's happening and look at the success story that uh, Bangladesh is providing. So thank you. And uh, so it's a really uh, important um, um, points there. So what we are at the moment is in a phase where the recipients of funding and the providers of funding are still trying to find each other in respect of what that funding should be applied to. Now, that, that, that seems a very strange thing to say because surely we've been doing development cooperation and climate, climate financing for many decades. Yes, we have. But, but therein lies the, the, the really counterintuitive part of this message is that we are still getting to the point where we have to understand that it is the in-country, it is the recipient country's um, needs that need to be um, serviced by flows of climate finance or adaptation finance. I found it very interesting, um, Hannah, I didn't realize uh, your, your comment about the EBRD um, looking more towards adaptation. Interestingly enough, there's a, there was a similar finding to a piece of research done uh, within the GCF. And the, the, that finding was that um, among the hurdles to disbursement of GCF funding were GCF internal policies themselves, which, which were not sufficiently intuitive to service the needs of their client. And their client is not the donors. Their client is the recipient country. So uh, we're, and, and, and again, perhaps to come back to, to this report, this report tries to tease out some of those, those those issues that developing countries face that perhaps would not occur in the normal course to a policy um, expert devising policy based in a developed country. Thank you very much for these comments, uh, Andrew. I think very important. And since you're talking about the ongoing complexity of climate finance and also the difficulties uh, in donor-recipient relations, uh, I just want to ask you, um, Olivia and Andrew, I mean, what are your expectations towards the EU when it comes to NDC updates in Sub-Saharan Africa? I think Anne just gave us a, a perfect overview of what's happening at the moment in the EU's climate development policy nexus. So can you give us some thoughts of the expectations um, Sub-Saharan Africans have towards uh, big donors such as the EU? I think flowing from the climate finance point, um, the EU has always traditionally been quite a strong supporter of climate finance and has provided, um, I mean, ever since 2014, the first major replenishment of the GCF um, and continues to do so through multiple financial avenues. So I suppose it would be continuing that type of financial support. But, you know, it's also the really small things um, that we were talking about at the beginning of this podcast that ha have been major stumbling blocks um, that I think with a bit of support and creative thinking uh, could make quite a big change. So uh, internet con connectivity was one issue that was mentioned. Um, uh, it's a major issue in a lot of LDCs in Africa um, having either a internet connection or at least one that's sufficiently stable um, to have um, in-country meetings regarding NDCs or at least uh, meetings with experts abroad online. Um, and so, goodness, I, I think one member at the AGN mentioned, you know, even just if um, EU country partners could offer their offices to host those types of meetings, um, uh, including the use of their internet connection. And um, that would be extremely helpful. Um, other things are hosting or finding creative ways of getting around uh, social distancing requirements as a result of COVID. So um, how do we get that sort of 
public buy-in, public uh, input into the NDC process. And, and this is particularly important because I think the 2015 NDCs were very much a rush job in a lot of African countries, understandably so, given other priorities at the time. But, um, you know, a, a lot of African countries themselves have admitted to the African Development Bank that they just cobbled something together at the last minute um, in order to submit, and they didn't conduct extensive stakeholder participation. There is now a substantial appetite to really reach out to the public and, and get their input and buy-in, and, and I don't need to cite to you the extensive research out there um, on the importance of public participation and buy-in in terms of um, success rates for implementation. And I think... Um, obviously, social distancing rules are problematic in having uh, traditional stakeholder consult, but with the requisite support, be it on um, you know, facilitated dialogues online and helping with um, short surveys. I know the NDC partnership has been quite active in a lot of countries with things like getting youth involvement um, and youth um, so, so, for example, youth groups together to come up with their own NDC. Um, so those types of alternatives, it's, it's tricky to think of something of a sufficient scale to get the level of public uh, or stakeholders participation that you'd really need for a document this important. Um, but ultimately, any type of facilitated support, um, offering venues, um, offering sort of online engagements uh, paid for and administered um, by other countries, I'm sure, would be extremely helpful. Formulation of policy often looks at the macro issues and tries to solve macro issues. But, but in order to get the macro issues solved, you need to um, get them down to the ground level. And those, that is a micro issue challenge. It's how do you get people in a room with a sufficiently strong internet connection. I know that might sound like a really silly and prosaic question, but it's not a problem. It's not a silly and prosaic problem for many African countries. It's a really important problem. Sorry, and, and one last important point I forgot to mention would be, um, and, and this ties to earlier comments made, would be to um, have experts give online support. So um, to consult on uh, comments on uh, draft NDCs and related adaptation plans or whatever they might be without the need to, to fly over here. Um, and I know there's considerable expertise internationally. The issue is getting people obviously into the country to comment. So um, a willingness to do so remotely and at low cost, I guess, would be extremely useful. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, I think these are some pretty clear expectations uh, which the which some sub-Saharan African countries may have towards the EU. And I shortly want to come back to Anne on this, on this topic. And uh, what can you say from a European perspective on these expectations? And are they sufficient to make sure that um, NDCs will be updated in the future? Well, um, I think these were very critical points, very important. They are, of course, very much linked to um, the, the COVID crisis we are finding ourselves in. And I would like to add a few other points um, that I think um, are issues that have been existing for, for a number of decades on the African uh, continent. So I think uh, one, one critical um, issue is the lack of access to data, climatic data, vulnerability assessments, and also um, issues with um, sharing this type of data. Um, and then um, another point that I would like to make, I think here in Europe, there has been a lot of noise around the European Green Deal. And um, I heard from our context at the African Union that um, the, the African Union is in the process of um, creating an African, not necessarily Green Deal, but they would call it the climate strategy. And I think it would be, it's also because of the COVID crisis actually that they will not be able to have this ready in time. But um, I think once it's ready, it could provide an important framework, policy framework that that could hopefully um, guide African countries in their um, in, in their climate plans or in the setup of their climate plans um, 
Now, perhaps um, I could elaborate a bit on the European Green Deal because it has been such a milestone um, policy year. Um, and, and also what it would mean for Africa, because uh, we have been scrutinizing the Green Deal. Um, and what we saw is that the external dimension of the, the initial Green Deal policy document, the declaration that was set out, um, was quite uh, limited. Um, there was also not so much um, on talk about adaptation, whereas this is very important for the relations that Europe has with African, especially sub-Saharan countries. Then I think another, another important policy declaration that dates back to um, March this year was the European Comprehensive Strategy for Africa. Um, and when we look at this um, very critically, we see that um, this, um, there is a very strong focus on technology, on formal sectors, on economic development, uh, mitigation also, and less on the informal sector, um, on human development, on agriculture, on adaptation. So this shows also, and the same with the Green Deal, what the interests are um, of the EU of the, uh, the EU vis-a-vis -vis Africa. And um, you can also uh, drop such an important sector as the informal sector, where so many people in Africa are, are being involved in. Um, then and this can actually, this leads to questioning whether they're actually able to um, deal with um, the COVID crisis and the aftermath of the crisis. Um, and the same when you, when uh, looking at uh, the climate action, there is really a strong focus by the EU on mitigation, on renewable energy. And I think they are missing important needs of African countries. Thank you, Anne, for these very critical and honest comments uh, of, of what's happening in, in the Brussels bubble, so to speak. Um, and I think it's also important not only that we have um, an understanding of what are the expectations of, uh, of African countries towards the EU, but also a better understanding of what the EU needs to improve to meet expectations. But um, I would like to finish with a question for all of you on a topic that I deem absolutely essential, um, and that's the future of the Paris Agreement. Um, if parties to the Paris Agreement fail to update NDCs until the end of the year or even until 2021, uh, the agreement's ratchet mechanism ups would absolutely be um, affected. Um, and this would be a heavy blow, I think, to the Paris Agreement, whose entire architecture is built on a system of constantly um, increased ambition. Um, so I think what COVID-19 basically shows um, is that the Paris Agreement seems to be inherently unstable. Every time we have an external shock, such as COVID-19, global climate action seems to be at risk. Um, so isn't there a need to launch a strategic reflection of the Paris Agreement and have an honest debate about whether the agreement is actually suitable in the long term to tackle climate change? And is there any way to strengthen uh, the enforcement mechanisms of the Paris Agreement? If I may, uh, um, I, so there's a, there's a lot implied in that. So uh, I'll, I'll make three points. The first one is, um, you're right. What's interesting about the Paris Agreement um, is that it moves away from the cycles of negotiation that we had up until Paris. And so the cycles of negotiation before Paris periodically tried to deliver um, heavy hitting agreements, for example, the UNFCCC or the Kyoto Protocol or the Durban Platform for Enhanced um, Climate Action. Paris is, is, in a sense, the end of that line, but it is the beginning of a new line. So Paris anticipates that we won't have heavy hitting conventions that, that demarcate the future. In fact, um, the ratcheting mechanism implies that um, the future will become increasingly regulated from a climate perspective as we go forward. That's a good and a bad thing. Um, and yes, you're right. There, are, there are, are inherent dangers because of that structure to Paris. But, but Louis, I, 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 I'd like to answer quite directly a question that, that, that you asked, which was, does the, uh, the, the shock, for example, caused by COVID require that we revisit or that we reflect on Paris? No, on the contrary. <laughs> um, Paris is there. Paris is a good structure for how to go forward. What, what we have learned from the COVID shock is that it's very easy for countries to find other reasons or to find reasons not to continue to comply with their already existing Paris Agreement. So, you know, the, the, the perceived and actual contraction in economic activity internationally brought a rash of countries to the fore who were saying, oh, well, 
you know, um, the, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions as a result of the contraction of economic activity means that we no longer need to take um, um, mitigation action. On the contrary, the science is, is telling us that the level of mitigation caused or emission reduction, let's use the proper term, the level of emission reduction as a result of COVID um, driven economic contraction is nothing like what we need scientifically to get to the objective of the Paris Agreement. So the reflection is not, do we need how to think, rethink Paris? Actually, the reflection is countries need to take their obligations much more seriously and stop looking for excuses not to comply with their obligations. Um, is that a strong enough statement? That is a really strong statement. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Olivia, Anne, do you have any additional thoughts on, the, on, the, on this question? Uh, I talk about this issue quite a lot with my students um, because I think with Paris, we see quite a strong departure from the traditional top-down model that we've seen in other international law instruments like the Vienna Convention or um, the uh, Convention on Biodiversity. You see, seeing something what we call bottom-up governance. So it's um, self-determined actions by individual states, but it's even more bottom-up because those actions are, are, I would argue, increasingly influenced by what's happening on the ground and local actors. And I mean, that's obviously not true for every state and it depends on how each individual country works and, and um, the level of citizen involvement but I, I certainly think the model that we see under Paris is very much um, multi-actor driven as opposed to just solely the state actor so the benefit of that is that it, it has a bit more longevity and I would hope buy-in from a, a wider audience. The risk though is that you depart from the traditional command and control kind of governance, governance uh, legal instrument that would give you the kind of comfort that you'd need in a pandemic, which is, you know, when things get difficult, it becomes harder for countries to back out from predetermined commitments. And those predetermined commitments are set in stone in a protocol or some other type of legal instrument. And I mean, <laughs> It is, it's deeply unfortunate that the pandemic happened at 2020, you know, like the real cusp, the year that was supposed to be uh, the shining star of the Paris Agreement of enhanced ambition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it, it really brings to the fore the weakness of this type of bottom-up governance instrument. That being said, you know, I don't think everything's lost. We're still going to have the COP in Glasgow next year. And um, all the issues that were going to be debated at the end of this year will still be on the negotiation table in a few months, certainly, I mean, there'll be, who knows, untold issues with enhancing ambition and finance and the like. Um, but I, I think in the longer run, hopefully we, we have an instrument now that's a lot um, more robust and immune to um, at least political whim at a state level because it has um, more stakeholder involved, well, more non-state actors involved in its implementation and there's a lot more buy-in um, and yeah. I think it'd be very hard for us to depart from I mean remember Cancun and um, from uh, sorry not Cancun Copenhagen in 2010 also proposed a very similar model to this um, and I don't think we're going to depart from it anytime soon. You're absolutely right and, and thank you for your comments on on, on, on bottom-up governance right uh, I think it's really a, a dilemma we basically have strengths and weaknesses and, and perhaps, Anna, you have some additional thoughts on that. Yeah, I was also going to say that I was happy uh, to hear Olivia say that, that there is more and more local involvement, that it's not only states uh, deciding on, on um, climate action. So that's a very important point. Um, but um, as in a, a blog post that I wrote when the Paris Agreement was was um, agreed by, by the, all the parties, was that it was a historic but fragile milestone. So I think it was very important, a much needed legal framework globally. And also it's it opened the door to the bottom up process of the NDCs that we have been discussing. But it's, um, and also it, it has given hope for a global collective climate action, I think, in that sense, it was really an important moment, um, but um, also fragile um, because of a number of, of reasons. And I think 
yeah, the, the, the main issue is that ultimately it will depend on states to implement climate plans. And so that's not up to the, to the Paris Agreement to, to, um, uh, to, have a, to have a say in that. So it's, it's really um, it depends on countries. And I think what's, what the EU has done with the Green Deal has been an important step forward. Also the climate law that has been discussed uh, this year. Um, to make um, emissions reduction in, within European member states legally binding. Um, and I think this can also be an important example for other countries in the world. And then um, when it comes to the, the COVID crisis, I think um, the, the rhetoric around Build Back Better that I mentioned earlier in our conversation is very important. And, and let's hope that new investments will be green and inclusive and sustainable overall. And, and let's try to be, um, let's be optimistic in that sense. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think it's very interesting to see uh, what kind of exciting topics uh, Olivia's and Andrew's policy paper can actually lead to. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to come to an end today, uh, but thank you very much to all of you for a very rich debate. Um, it was really a pleasure. Um, thank you also to all of our listeners that you joined us today. Um, we will be back very soon with a new fresh discussion bridging the gap between the EU and the global south. We look forward to the next discussion and until then, stay safe and goodbye. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you. We invite you to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and SoundCloud. You can find all the necessary links here in the description. Again, thank you very much for joining us today and stay tuned for the next podcast of the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. Bye. Thank you.